Hey, what's up, guys? And welcome to episode 79 of Talk 4, the quickfire podcast where we ask four great questions to unique and interesting people. Behind the mic today is your host, Louis Scoopian. That's me. And uh, let me introduce our incredible guest for today. Eddie Hamilton is going to be answering a few questions today. Eddie, welcome aboard the Talk 4 podcast. Please say hi to the fine people listening and just, yeah, just give us a rundown of who you are and what you do. And then we'll shoot a few questions at you. Great. Thanks for inviting me on. My name's Eddie Hamilton. I'm a film editor. Um, I have been working in the industry for probably about nearly 30 years now. And uh, I have worked on uh, Top Gun Maverick, most famously, uh, Mission Impossible Fallout, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, um, Kick-Ass, Kingsman, uh, X-Men First Class, among others. So I've worked quite a lot with director Matthew Vaughan and then a lot with director and producer Christopher McQuarrie and of course Tom Cruise and uh yeah we're we're just coming to the end of uh working on Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part One which has been nearly three years of work um so it's very exciting that people around the world are finally going to get to see it um film editing is uh, an amazing um creative job you're you're the the absolute hub of everything that goes into making a film Mm -hmm. you take all the footage that maybe up to three or four hundred people have worked on between action and cut um all that information that picture and sound comes into your um computer your laptop or your desktop whatever and you work on it you're in charge You, you control everything that the audience sees and hears from the very beginning of the movie to the very end of the movie, every single image, how long they hear it or how long they see it Mm -hmm. and what sound they hear, what music they hear, what sound effects they hear all the way through to the end credits of the movie. Mm -hmm. And it's, you you have enormous power and control over how you manipulate the audience and how you affect their um, perception of time and emotion. And, um then once you've you know after many 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 months of work years sometimes then then all, all the information that that you have um all the, the all the sequences that you've built then gets get sent out to the music department the sound department um the visual effects department and then the color department and for kind of final post production touches so that's my job i think it's the best job um Obviously, I love doing it and I it, no two days are the same. And um, I kind of pinch myself every day I go to work that I'm I'm doing something that I've been passionate about all my life, you know, and getting paid to do it. It's great. Mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, it clearly is. And it's just a beautiful thing that you've got to do that then. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I was always thinking I was wondering with um, when you take like the music side of things with movie making, I was always wondering if you kind of edit the movie in a style that goes to the music or if the music comes as kind of like the post thing. So interesting that you've clarified that because that was actually something I've always sort of wanted to know about. Um, But yeah, like you said, Top Gun Maverick, my favorite movie and you're doing all the Mission Impossible stuff. So it's fair to say that Tom Cruise has had his fair share of time on your displays and stuff, I can imagine. But so, yeah, we look at all these incredible projects you're doing now. But um, just take us back, like for question one, wind back the clocks a bit. So how did you begin on your path in editing video and movies? And what was your dream with it? And uh, just take us through your kind of just your little process into getting to where you are now. Yeah, sure. So um, I I remember that a big kind of bolt of lightning happened to me when I was around eight years old. Um, when I saw Star Wars on TV, I didn't get taken to the movies much as a kid. Um, my parents weren't really into films. And, you know, I I got to see, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and Bambi and the odd Bond movie, but, it, but never really anything else. And so I saw Star Wars when it was on TV and I remember seeing people's names at the end of the credits and thinking, wow, do, 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 hum- do people actually make films? And and when I was eight, like the penny dropped that maybe this was something that you could actually do with your life. And so from that age, I was obsessed with movies and movie music and behind the scenes um, visual effects and everything that went into making films. So I, I used to read as many books as I could and watch as many films as I could and 
listen to music and anything that was on TV about how films were made, I would I'd record it, you know, on a VHS tape and watch it over and over again. And I learned so much about um, how films are made and, and, you know, how movie music was recorded and how visual effects were done. I remember um, at school when I was about 16 doing a, a project on film visual effects based on, you know, matte paintings and models and miniatures and photochemical compositing and all that stuff that I'd seen and, and loved in Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi and many other movies that ILM had worked on, Industrial Light and Magic. Hmm. And w- when I was at school about the same age, I hooked up two VHS machines and was playing around with editing montages of my favourite movies to kind of my favourite soundtracks. And I found that hours would fly by in the creative process. I'm quite a nerd, so I like technology. I love storytelling. And editing is this wonderful combination of storytelling and technology. Um, and so I discovered that that maybe instead of being a writer or a director, which is what I thought I would be, because when you're young, you just think you're going to be Steven Spielberg or George Lucas or James Cameron, you know. And I I decided that maybe editing was where my future lay. Um, And so uh, I went to university at University College London, did a psychology degree, but I knew that UCL had a great film and student, film and TV student film society, you know, student Mm -hmm. society. And so I spent basically eight hours a day of my three years at university making student films and TV and the bare minimum of time doing my my degree, but I still managed to get a 2-1 in psychology after three years, amazingly. And then after that, I actually failed to get into film school. I applied to the National Film School, the Royal College of Art, Northern School of Film and Television. But I didn't get in. I was a bit young and I was unashamedly commercial in my tastes, um, which didn't necessarily go down, down that well, I don't think. I hadn't really had any formal film training. I hadn't watched any foreign films hadn't studied film history that much. I was just a child of the 80s and I was in love with, you know, Back to the Future and Robocop and Die Hard and all those movies that had really touched me in the 80s. And so I ended up getting a job as a runner uh, in a post-production facility in central London, making tea and getting lunch. And around about then, which was 1994, 95, that was when the very early avid media composers were starting to get used seriously in um, offline editing. So mm-hmm. I taught myself how to use that that program and um, spent about a year editing Portuguese and Spanish sport television programs, which is the which is mostly what this post-production facility did. And then uh, but always always wanted to work on you know low budget indie movies with a view to one day working on these kind of big action adventure movies that i'd seen and loved as a kid and i i i basically found a a movie that was a very very low budget movie that was being made and i reached out to the producer and the director and i said you have anyone editing your film and they said no so i basically worked on that for a few months for free Mm -hmm. and then that led to kind of me meeting other young filmmakers in london and none of the films were necessarily very good and not many people saw them but they were they were great, you know, low budget movie experiences. And I used to pay the rent by editing promos for the Paramount Comedy Channel two days a week and then use the other five days a week to work on stuff for free and slowly work my way up the the kind of ladder of the film industry as an editor. Um, did loads and loads of short films. Um, and then my big break really was meeting Matthew Vaughan in 2001. And I did a film that he was producing called Mean Machine, Mm. which had Vinnie Jones playing football in prison. Uh, Jason Statham was in it as well. But that was that was a film that was being made by Paramount in the UK. So it was and it was it had a six million pound budget, which was certainly the biggest of anything that I'd done up to that point. And so that relationship with Matthew kind of led on to things like Kick-Ass and X-Men First Class and Kingsman over many years, you know. Um, And when I was doing Kingsman in 2015, 2014, 
we were doing the, the, the first Kingsman, the final sound mix on that. I got an, uh, a call about maybe going to meet the director of Mission Impossible. And that's when I met Chris McQuarrie. And I never thought they'd give me the job, to be honest, because <laughs> um, I'd never, never done a film of that scale on my own. But I went in with a very enthusiastic, positive attitude and said to myself, right, you're not going to screw this up. It's going to work very, very hard and try and do your best work every day, which I always do. Um, and that and and I met Tom Cruise on that film and that led on to Mission Impossible Fallout and then on to Top Gun Maverick, which was incredible getting a call to work on that film and working with Jerry Bruckheimer, working with Joe Kaczynski, the director, living in L.A. for a year, took my family over to L.A., spent you know weeks and weeks on different naval bases around the 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 west coast of america um and then when we after two years working on top gun went on to dead reckoning part one so that's kind of a potted history of of you know starting uh making tea and then 20 years after that getting a call to do mission impossible so it was a very 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 long journey um to kind of slowly move up the industry and get to that that kind of level of working on the the, the most ambitious films being made today. That's just amazing. And yes, yeah, so true. You really did kind of climb that ladder over a long time. And I've yeah. it's just fascinating to see that kind of a story. But it's funny because I had this talk with someone else in the podcast a while ago, though, but it tends to be that the people who are genuinely really passionate about something or they've got a genuine interest and invested interest in an industry or something like a movie thing, or if you're really into that kind of a thing. And then when you go into something like this, you've you've got so much just firepower and so much experience from watching them and consuming it that you're going to do such a good job at actually creating a vision for these movies in the future so I mean I have to say it's just great and very inspiring to hear that kind of a story but so obviously these kind of movies there's a lot of moving parts in them and you've got loads of yeah. very important people and it's, it must be a challenge with the communication side of things so just as an editor how do you collaborate with the directors and other team members to create a movie with a unified vision and regardless of that how much of your personal style and flair do you get to express in the editing when you're creating the final product that is a really great question it varies from film to film um but the the true answer is that that i watch the footage that comes from the camera from the shoot days and i let the footage dictate to me how how it feels like it should be put together i don't at this stage of my career i don't really implant any um specific creative vision on it initially because you just want to you want to feel your way through all the raw footage and put it together put it together in the way that best reflects um, the strengths of the raw material and once you've got and and like anything creative the first time you do anything it's pretty rough and raw and won't necessarily be very good because it'll, it'll be way too long and it'll be lumpy and it won't be focused and it won't have any any style really because you're just kind of starting with very raw material and the process of the creative process of editing is something where you work at it for weeks and months, every sequence, every shot in the film, you work at improving it and improving it and improving it and refining it. A little bit like if you're writing something or if you're you know, sketching a, a drawing or something, you kind of work at all the details slowly, slowly. You know, when you're painting a room, for example, you you start with a roller and you paint like most of the room, but then you you use smaller and smaller paintbrushes as you kind of get closer to the edge of the room. That's a great it's, way. Of it's like, it. yeah, it's like that. It's like that with um with editing. You know, you start off in broad strokes to get something down on the timeline, and then you end up refining it. Um, but you do work very closely with the director and with the producer. Initially, on the very first pass. What happens is they'll 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 film on day one of principal photography, and on day two you get all the footage from day one and you start building it, breaking down it. Because one of the things I'm really thorough about is is breaking down all the footage so that I can find stuff very quickly later. You know, if you've got two or three or four hours of footage 
um, it, you can't just load it on a timeline and scrub up and down and hope to find anything. I kind of break everything down by lines of dialogue or by pieces of action, if it's an action sequence, so that I can see all the kind of uh, corresponding angles for a particular piece of action. And then you can review it quickly with the director later, you know, months later when you finish filming, you're refining the edit. But one of the great privileges of being an editor is that you're the first person to see the film come to life. Yeah. Because when you when you start putting the shots together, you're literally the first pair of eyes on, on the planet to see the film um, having some kind of life beyond the, the raw footage, which is just lots and lots of coverage of one character saying something and another character saying something and wide shots and medium shots and you know the film doesn't really exist as a movie until you start editing it together mm -hmm. you know unless you've got a film which is literally one uninterrupted shot um but the power of editing is that is that you can then choose once you've got a rough structure you can then choose which way to go and how to refine it and you then start thinking about ways of um of of adding a kind of sense of 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 style or rhythm or pace to it you know and sometimes that comes with music although um the director i'm working with mal chris chris mccory he really dislikes using music as a creative tool until much later in the process he he wants us to work on the scenes and make sure that they work first visually so quite often we'll work with no sound at all um, and then we'll turn on the dialogue and he'll listen to it or listen to what sound was there. Certainly action sequences, we work on completely silent. Wow. And we imagine the, the percussive nature of punches or gunshots or car tires squealing or <laughs> motorbikes revving or, or whatever it is. The Hollywood effect. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so you're imagining all that stuff as you edit it. And then you start to layer in the dialogue, layer in the sound effects. And then right at the end, we layer in the music. Sometimes we will adjust the edit very slightly to hit certain musical beats, but but really we want we want the scenes to work. You know, pure cinema is visual storytelling with no dialogue at all. You know, and so and and you know a lot of the audience out there don't speak English. You know, who watch these movies. So really, the emotions that you're trying to communicate should come through the composition and the lens choices and and the behavior of the cast and then the dialogue that gets laid in is is another um aspect of communicating you know the emotion to the audience and then after that the sound effects and the music but um we so, so when we first screen these films we very often have no music on them at all so that it's a very raw kind of unprocessed way of watching it but you get a sense of if you feel anything just from the images and the behavior and the and the dialogue and the sound effects um so however working with a director like Matthew Vaughan he really likes using temp score so you know I'll be working with music from other films and from other movies that he's worked on just to just to start getting a sense or a vibe sometimes when I'm editing I'll have my my you know spotify playlist on shuffle and it'll just play random stuff which might inspire different rhythms or ideas or different a different pace to try um sometimes i'll work with a piece of music and then turn it off just to see how it how something plays visually um you know so but i i would say earlier on in my career i might try if, i might have imposed a bit more style on something earlier mm -hmm. but now with a lot more kind of experience and maturity, I I tend to watch the footage and just let it speak to me and figure out how I'm going to build it from there, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I totally do. Um, so just something that's popped into my head while you've been talking about this now, um, I'm just interested, like, just to kind of dig into a bit of, like, the mentality towards this. Um, do you feel a lot of pressure with your job? Do you feel like with these kind of huge budgets going into the movies and stuff. And, you know, you have these, this end product, like all the filming's done, you've got all the content there and you've got this monumental task of constructing this movie. Do you feel pressurized? And do you feel like, uh, I really hope this kind of does well. Or do you have like complete trust yeah. in your process? Yeah, no, it is. It, it, listen, the responsibility is enormous on something like Top Gun Maverick. Um, the film had to work. 
on Mission Impossible, the film has to work. And we take the responsibility to the studio, to Paramount Pictures, to any studio, very seriously. They're investing a lot of money and time in um, the filmmakers. Uh, so, you know, Chris McCrory, Chris McCrory, Tom Cruise, myself, all the other heads of department, you know, production design, wardrobe, hair and makeup, visual effects, um, cinematography, all, everybody involved takes their responsibility very seriously. And you do feel pressure, but the process, if you, if you engage with the process, um, which involves showing the movie to an audience and then listening to the audience and listening to how they react to it and listening to them tell you when it's confusing, when it's boring, when it's slow, um, and really confronting the film after each screening and, and listening carefully to what the audience tells you and addressing the notes. So if the audience is telling you that a really... Um, you know, elaborate stunt sequence is too long and boring, then you look at it and you cut it down. You, you, And sometimes you remove really elaborate parts of the movie that you thought were great or you still think are great, but in the run of the movie, they're too long. Um, so that is part of the process. And and the, the more you do it, the more you realise that things never start off well. Interestingly, the easier a film is to watch, almost the harder it has been to make, because to make something that is completely effortless to watch, where it just feels like everything has fallen into place. And of course, it was supposed to be that way. And you can't imagine it any other way is is almost the hardest, the harder the harder kind of films to put together. Mm. And certainly on on a film like Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part One, we you know, we have been working on the movie for nearly three years at this point and screened the movie many, many times and shown it to, to audiences and listened carefully to their responses. And we really want the film to be great. And we want it to be great from the very first second to the very last second. We don't want a single moment of the movie to sag or be confusing or to or to kind of let you down or disappoint you. And the same with Top Gun, you know, um, very few people thought making a sequel to Top Gun was a good idea. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that from the very beginning of the film, even over the opening music, over the Paramount logo, and then over the um, opening titles, we use the same typeface and the same logos and the same music. And we, we treated the images the same. So you really felt like, the filmmakers cared about your experience and that you were being welcomed back into the world of Top Gun. So by the time Danger Zone kicks in, you're just thinking, OK, this is great. I remember feeling this way on the first movie and I'm going to give the filmmakers a and uh, they haven't screwed it up in the first five minutes. And I give them a chance to keep keep my interest. And then, of course, we meet Maverick. We change the channel and we meet Maverick in his hangar and he goes to the Dark Star and does that whole Mark 10 sequence which is very different to the first movie, but reintroduces you to the character of Maverick and is great fun and is, is visually stunning and very suspenseful and has beautiful music. And he says, talk to me, goose in the air. And then of course you have the scene with Ed Harris. And then by the time that he's riding into Top Gun on his bike and you have the Top Gun anthem playing and the F-18 blasting, you're just thinking, mm. okay, this is it. I'm totally in. It's awesome. I love this. And uh, we've kind of won the audience over, I hope, by that point. Um, but we really worked hard at it. It did not come easily. You know, there were many different ways. There, there, were, there were several different openings that we tried and different ways of, of cutting the Dark Star sequence and ways of communicating all that emotion. And we just kept working at it and working at it and working at it. So you do feel the responsibility. And if the film isn't working, it's very disappointing. Sure. But you know that with time and hard work you can improve it and make it and make it great absolutely very very true um bit of trivia then was playing danger zone at the beginning of top gun maverick was that always a non-negotiable or were there kind of um was, was there kind of like an adversary idea to have like something new or was it always going to be that kind of a callback thing do you think i tom cruise's idea was always we've got to start this movie in a very similar way to the first movie in order to 
put the audience right back in the mental headspace of of the world of Top Gun. And we always were going to use Danger Zone, I think. There was a thought about maybe re-recording it, but the original version of Danger Zone is such a classic. Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? That that um we didn't we didn't want to mess with it really. And uh yeah, we we just leaned into it. So th- there was never really an idea of not doing that. The only thing that's interesting, Louis, is that it is very similar to the first Top Gun, but the original opening montage of the first Top Gun, I think, if memory serves, is around two minutes 20. And originally my montage in Top Gun Maverick was the same length. But because audiences' tastes for the uh, tempo of a movie have changed over the decades... I ended up having to cut about a minute out of the opening montage and make it about a minute and 20 seconds. And it almost has double the number of shots as the original. So it's it's a minute shorter and has twice as many shots. And the music, the Top Gun anthem that plays is uh, compressed as well. So if you literally start both movies and play them side by side, you'll see that we get to Danger Zone about a minute earlier in Top Gun Maverick than we did in the original Top Gun. Okay. And that's just that's just the way that that you know audiences prefer to be propelled through a film quicker. I think these days than they did back in the in the mid eighties. How do you know that? How do I know what? How do you know that audiences prefer that? Like, is there? Well, a I think I think you film? just you just feel it when you watch the film. You just mm. feel like, gosh, this is going. This is this feels quite long. It's going on quite a long time, mm-hmm. and and let's get on with it. You know, and if you watch the original Top Gun today, it does really take its time on that first montage to get going, um, and so it, it's it's something which you just feel and when you one of the stages of film editing is once you've got the whole movie together and you've kind of got it working you go through the film and you look at every single shot and every frame of every shot and you ask yourself does this shot need to be in the movie can it be shorter can i remove it all together and it's called a trim pass and the idea is to make sure that the, the story is moving as fast as it can move without it being confusing mm. um Audiences and also audiences are very sensitive to repetition. So if you use the same shot more than once in a sequence, the audience can sense that. And sometimes they the, they start to feel like the movie's repeating itself. And so they'll they'll emotionally disengage from the film. And that happens really quickly. Um, and so you're you're interrogating every shot in the film and you're saying, in the audience's mind, are they leaning into the film or are they withdrawing from the film you know is the is the needle moving into the green or is it moving into the red and you want the audience constantly leaning in and feeling like they're never ahead of the film um unless you really want to give them an insight into something that's going to happen that the characters are not aware of which does happen in mission impossible sometimes in which case then it's delicious because you know that something's going to happen and the characters aren't aware of it and the audience is in suspense thinking what's going to happen you know in two minutes when the characters discover that this thing is going to go wrong. Uh, and so that that's basically the process. You're constantly trying to kind of compress, 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 compress. Um, and quite often you'll over tighten the movie. So it becomes too fast and incomprehensible and the audience withdraws, withdraws from it because they're confused because they're not given enough time or they're not given enough, um, uh, they're not given enough of an emotional weight in, in certain dramatic sequences. So they don't feel anything or they don't understand the sake, the stakes of an action sequence. Yeah. You're constantly kind of modulating the pace of the movie so that you find that total sweet spot from beginning to end. Awesome. That's really interesting trivia. I'm, I'm loving this. Um, so going on to that, that thing about the process then. So this is going to sound like a scary question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big one, but actually, just just in a nutshell. So, how do you actually edit a movie? So, obviously, it's a huge topic and a lot to cover. But I was wondering if you could just take us through, like, stage by stage, kind of in a nutshell, when you've got okay. this content and film, like, how do you set sail on turning this into the end? I product? see. It, it, it's it's a very long process, and the, basically, there are two 
maybe three types of sequences. You have you have dialogue sequences, you have montages, and then you may have action sequences. And when you're editing a dialogue scene, you are you're looking at all the characters in the scene and you are trying to uh, put yourself in the audience's point of view or put yourself in the audience's headspace and you're thinking, who is the protagonist of this scene? So who's the lead character? Say Maverick is the lead character. And then who are the uh, secondary characters? So, you know, you've got Rooster, maybe Hangman, maybe Phoenix, uh, maybe Penny, whoever. And you're using the different types of shots that you have to tell the audience who has power in the scene or who is under pressure in the scene by choosing whether to use a medium shot or a close up and how to use composition to tell the or to infer to the audience about the character's state of mind. Um, interestingly, you're always balancing information and emotion in a scene and Information is the death of emotion and you want the audience to have an emotional experience. And generally speaking, the closer you are to a character, the more emotionally connected you are to them or the more the more that you feel like you're processing their thoughts. Whereas the further away you are from a character, the wider you are in the scene, the more it's about the geography of the characters, where they're standing. Uh, but it's less emotional. So you're finding this balance between making the scene as emotional as possible, but also trying to make sure that the audience is never lost in the geography of the scene where everybody is. Um, uh, some great directors will combine shots so that they start wide and then push into a character or they create coverage within a scene. But you're trying, you're trying to make sure that the audience is, is having a seamless emotional experience from beginning to end. And they're connected with the main protagonist of the film uh, who is Ethan Hunt or, or you know, Pete Mitchell, Maverick in Top Gun. And you want the audience to, to, to have an emotional connection to that character and to understand how they're feeling minute to minute through the film, what they want, what they're trying to achieve, what their obstacles are, and how they feel about that through the movie from beginning to end. So, so that you... Uh, so that you're completely emotionally engaged. And it's very, very difficult to get the balance of that right. But that's what you're trying to do during a dialogue scene is you're trying to connect with the protagonist and, and feel your way through the emotion of the scene. What does that character want? What do the other characters want? Where does the scene turn? Because normally there's a turning point in the scene where a character learns something or something significant happens. You know how to make sure the audience are, is aware of that emotional turn um and then in an action sequence what's most important is that you understand the stakes of the action sequence so you have to set it up properly you know what is this character after in this action sequence what happens if they fail what happens if they succeed and that is how you lean in and you you care about the the end result of the action sequence um making sure that the geography is clear so you can see where your protagonist is and where they are in space compared to the antagonist or whoever's called whoever's creating an obstacle for them so that you understand you know what they have to achieve and how far they have to travel in the space to achieve it all that stuff um which, which is you know essential and then it's about the rhythms and the pace and giving the audience making it feel unexpected and exciting using music to kind of allow the audience to put their emotions in certain uh, parts of the scene, you know, whether to feel excited, whether to feel suspense, whether to feel scared, whether to laugh. Mm. So, so it's, it's a very long process. So each day I look through all the footage, I break it down line by line, and then I start building the scene with all those criteria in mind, you know, trying to make sure that, that I'm always think putting myself in the audience's point of view. What do they need to see? next what do they need to hear next so that they understand how the protagonist is feeling in any particular moment um and it always starts out very long and lumpy and confusing and then over the course of the shoot you start building up the movie in the computer so that by the end of the filming process you've got like a very rough pass of everything then you sit with the director 
it's always a very depressing experience because the first assembly of any movie is always is always you know a, a mess to be honest mm. and it's it's unfocused and it's very it's it's quite often confusing um and so you, you, so you, experienced directors understand that um and then you start working at each scene um and you take you know several days usually to work on each scene and you improve it and you improve it and then you work your way through the whole movie and then you watch the whole movie again and then you can start to feel like where it's working where it still needs more more um improvement where the pace is slow where the pace is fast and then what what you might be able to remove out of the film um to compress it if it's too long and most movies are too long to be honest at this stage so you're constantly asking yourself what can i take out but not sacrifice on the on the clarity of the story and the emotions from beginning to end um and it can take a very long time so top gun maverick took two years we had over 800 hours of raw footage on that movie um we got a similar amount of footage on mission impossible dead reckoning part one and that's you know we've spent nearly three years but we have been filming parts little sections of part two as we've been going along so it hasn't all been part one so probably if we were just doing part one it would be about two years if i'm being honest wow. but you know we started in um september 2020 and as we speak it's june 2023 and the movie's coming out in july 2023 so it has been you know a nearly three-year journey for me um yeah and then you work on sound effects you work on music you work on visual effects sometimes on these big movies the visual effects you have to get them started months or maybe even years in advance because some of the visual effects shots are very very complex um and you know one of the things that you're doing is looking at the footage and working out if anything is missing so that you can feed back to the direct director and the producers that we haven't got this little piece of action so we might need to go back on the set with the actors and get this little piece to make sure that we we we've got everything covered before they knock the sets down all that kind of stuff so it's it's very creatively rewarding but it's very very hard work you know my days normally start normally leave leave home around half past six start work at half past seven um and then work till maybe you know eight or nine p.m depending on the day and you know sometimes i'm home by nine sometimes i'm home by ten and that can be six or seven days a week depending on how intense the schedule is um so you know the hours are quite long but i have a great team around me a team of assistant editors who help me and um but also i want to do a great job you know I, i'm passionate about what i do i love what i do and i i'm i strive to be one of the best in the world at what i do um uh which is a very subjective so you you know it, it's something that you can aim for but you can never really attain but I, I've always had that kind of drive to be really good at my job and to want to deliver the very best work every day. It's really the only thing you have control over in your life as well, because there are so many other factors, external factors that you have no control over. But the one thing you can control is how hard you work at what you want to achieve in your life. And so I've always had that kind of drive, you know, um, to try and be great, uh, every day if i can that's great eddie and it's it's clear that you're a absolute expert of what you do and you're just a magician with all, all these things um so last little question then um just something yeah. i want to tap into your brain here a bit then so obviously like we said you're at the top of the game when it comes to editing and creating these incredible movies but my question is for the much smaller guys and people like myself and other youtubers who are making you know short form contents much more basic video stuff do you have yeah. any tips resources courses or tools that helped you which might help up the game and ability of our content on these platforms too that's that's really it's a great question the the thing is that the the industry is constantly evolving okay so what what i was learning on 20 years ago um was not available on every laptop but now it is you can even edit on your phone you know for free but the the real trick is to keep doing it uh and do it as often as you can and fail as quickly as you can so that you can start to improve it's 
there's a theory that it takes 10,000 hours to get good at something, which I think is true. You can get good at anything that you want to if you practice it for 10,000 hours. Now, that sounds like a lot of time, but actually it's realistically, it's about four years of really hard work. So if you were to work, you know, 200 days a year, uh, yeah, um, for 10 hours a day, or, or say 250 days a year, let's say, for you know, if you've got 365 days a year, if you take off weekends, that roughly leaves 250 days a year. And if you work for 10 hours a day, that's 2,500 hours a year. So four years, you can do 10,000 hours. And if you wanted to learn the guitar or learn the violin or learn the drums or learn to cook or um, uh, or, or or learn to paint or whatever it is that you want to, if you did literally did it for 10 hours a day for four years, you would be very good at it. And so I feel like that that is a really good metric uh, with which to kind of guide yourself through your 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 learning adventure, you know. And um, if you want to make films, you should write a little one page script on a Friday and film it with your friends on a Saturday and then edit it together on a Sunday with music and sound effects and put it on YouTube on a, on a Sunday night. And if you do that, you know, every week for a year, you'll have made 50 short films and you will have learned a lot. You would have made a lot of mistakes and Honestly, within within one or two films, you'll soon learn how important sound recording is and all that stuff, which you think is really simple when you start, but actually is essentially important, you know, in order to make the film watchable. Um, so the other thing is there's a really great online editing course called Inside the Edit, which is a, a gift, really, if you want to learn how to edit Um it's run by a friend of mine, a guy called Paddy Bird, who is a very, very experienced editor. He has an amazing podcast called um, Once Upon a Timeline. And, and honestly, it's the best editing podcast in terms of the creativity of editing, not about whether you use Avid Media Composer or Premiere or Final Cut. He just talks about the, the creative instinct that you need to hone behind editing. Um, and his online course is absolutely fantastic. And he has free taster courses as well. So you don't even, you know, need to pay anything up front in order to experience it. Um, but that that I think is a really great resource to learn about, you know, the all the different um aspects of creative editing. Um but yeah, I the main advice is just to do it as much as you can and to fail as quickly as you can so that you improve as quickly as you can. Brilliant advice, Eddie. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, well, that has been our four questions for today. And uh, before we wrap this up, it is time for what I like to call the, uh, the shameless plug. So, Eddie, feel free to take a minute and just promote anything that you're working on, you want people to take a look at or just something you believe in. Um, I would love everyone to go and see Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 when it hits the cinemas later in July 2023. Um and if you're listening to this way in the future, then then try and find it, seek it out uh, online somewhere or get a Blu-ray or a 4K disc. But the we've worked at it incredibly hard. I, I really hope it's a great night at the movies. The same team behind Top Gun Maverick, pretty much. Um, certainly led by Tom Cruise, who cares passionately about creating great uh, movie experiences for worldwide audiences. I'm super proud of it. Um, it's it's a great, great, exciting, adventurous movie. And I think you'll all enjoy it. So check it out. OK, I will. I can't wait to go and see that. So as soon as that hits the cinemas, I'm going to be right over there. But yeah, Eddie, thank you so much for joining me today for the Talk 4 podcast. It has been an absolute pleasure having you on. And thank you for making the time to do this. Thanks for inviting me on, Louis. Great to speak to you. No worries at all. And thank you guys for listening. This has been episode 79. And if you'd like to listen to the past episodes, go and have a look at our channel. And if you'd like to listen in for the future ones, make sure to hit that subscribe button and spread some love by leaving a like and a comment. Signing off for now.